So we have to make eye contact with the audience. Oh god, I didn't know we were performing this live. <laughs> Hello everybody. Totoro. Fuzzy ones. They're bringing the party. They are bringing the party. They're Look at Totoro's making it they're rain. literally the party <laughs> animals. I was laughing earlier thinking about these guys' names. The dragon and the falcon. It's like, dude, this is the casting of a kung fu movie. Welcome to Dog Ear Discourse, our nerdy little double date where we talk about the book we're reading and where we left off. Every month, we're pulling a new and exciting book from our shelf. We've broken them down so you can buddy read with us or just hang out while we discuss, predict, and nerd out. If you want to read along, right now we're reading Uprooted by Naomi Novik. We are reading up to page 226, which is the end of chapter 16. Do not start chapter 17. You can if you want, but we didn't. Quick recap of the characters, just so that everybody is on the same page. We have Ian Yashka, who is our main character. We have the dragon, who is a wizard, not a dragon, very misleading. We have Kasha, who is the main character's best friend. Prince Merrick, a very handsy monarch. And the falcon, pr the prince's wizard friend. Let's start out with our 60-second recap. Danny, can you give us the 60-second recap of the first half of the book? Sure. And Juan, are you ready with the timer? Three, two, one, go. All right, so we have our main character who has a best friend, Kasha, and everybody in this village thinks that her best friend, Kasha, is going to be chosen by the dragon, and so she's just soaking up her time with her best friend until the day comes, and everybody stands in a line, and instead of the dragon choosing Kasha, he chooses her instead because he realizes that she has some magical ability. And so she gets taken to this tower, and she's completely not prepared for it at all because everybody assumed it was going to be somebody else. 30 seconds. And so she doesn't even know what she's doing there. So she starts cooking. She thinks that's what her job is there to provide this wizard dragon guy some meals. And that's it. And she gets pretty bored pretty quickly. And she gets into a lot of trouble. And then along the way, she 15. realizes that she knows how to do some magics. And he helps her along, realizing that too. Ten. And they form a bond. And they start spending some extra time together, doing little magics Five. together. And it turns into some extra alone time. That's Done. <laughs> I did not include any of the other plot points because there's some other ones in there, but that's okay. We can talk about those later. <laughs> you the got rest through, of the plot will be a surprise. <laughs> you got through like the first two chapters. <laughs> like, right on. Perfect. You perfect. got the main points no, of that relationship, I think. Nothing else is important to me. <laughs> Once upon a time. Romance and that's it. And yep. done. Once upon a time. No, that was great. Good job. Yeah. Good job. Quick intro, Danielle was giving the synopsis. Hi. On the timer was Juan. Yeah. I am Kelly, and off to my side is Chris. Hello. Chris, do you want to explain the theme dr drink for the first half of the book? Do we have a name for the theme drink? Uh, Through the Wood. Yeah, mm -hmm. she nixed my name for it, so I didn't know what the name was. Oh. So okay. what, what was your name for it? I want to hear the nope. alternatives. I no way. Know. It was a very long name, and she was like, no, you can't use that. It's Fine. hard to put them on the, the Instagram. little square Instagram thing. Sure. I it's was hard. thinking of a name for a pawn shop, and I was going to call it Once Upon a Time. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, I like it. So this one is Into the Wood. Um, and this... <laughs> <laughs> no. Say that again. <laughs> Into the wood. <laughs> <laughs> this drink is called Into the Wood. W U with one of those little lines over it. D. <laughs> the umlas. It's like okay. a smiley face. <laughs> is that what that's called? An umla? I think so. Umlat. Umlat. It's a lot of ums. Umlat. 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 Anyway, this drink is called Into the Wood. And it is a mixture of cream de menthe, white rum, ginger beer, and we have a blackberry syrup spiral that goes around the outside. And it's garnished with a blackberry and some rosemary. And the there is a splash of, um, of Angostura bitters in there. It's a very pretty drink. Mm -hmm. Thank you for making the drink, Chris. Should we cheers? Cheers our beautiful drink. Cheers. Juan has already finished his drink. <laughs> uh, yeah, it looks like I have. <laughs> <laughs> so right off the bat, the first thing that I notice about this book is that it's all told in first person versus third person. 
And I feel like I haven't really read a first person book in a long time. Do you guys have any like preferences over whether it's first or third person? Does it really matter? What do you guys think? I feel like when it's first person, at least for me, it's a little bit more immersive. Like a like if I'm imagining something in my head, if it's third person, I'm always hovering this person over their shoulder. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's just from video from playing games, but I'm just imagining that I'm like an extra head on like I'm Siamese, this, whatever, the twin with the other head. <laughs> oh, right you like that to him. dude from uh, from Total Recall with the little mutant baby yeah. in his gut and stuff like that? It comes out and attacks. The What's it? Coado? Gu- gu- I don't something. remember. Start the reactor. Um, I think that first person can throw me off a lot easier than third person. In third person, when someone does something, I expect it to be that character doing it and so i can go through my head and justify it but when it's first person i get frustrated if they do something that i wouldn't personally do and i'm like why are you being dumb actually something just piggybacking off of what you said sometimes if if they fool me when i'm in their head reading and then later they're like, oh, I devised the plan, but I didn't tell you, the reader, about it. I'm like, I thought it was a voice in your head. You betrayed me. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else feels that way, but I thought there was a bond between I and the character's thoughts. Then later they're like, nah. Mm. I really like first person kind of for the reason that Juan said, where you can get into their head and kind of put yourself in their shoes. But also I pr- kind of, I think in general, I prefer third person just because then you can kind of see more of the big picture and see, oh, here's what these people are doing over here and here's what these people are doing over here, whereas first person really kind of puts you in a spot and that's all you can see is that one perspective. Yeah, I I agree with that. It kind of depends, though. I think this one did first person really well. I think it did first person really well, but I didn't connect that well with the first person. Mm. And so that I'm going to transition to another topic that we have here um with it, which is like how well you connected with the person that was the main character mm-hmm. right the person that it was the first person um so we're gonna go over to Juan first I want to know from your your perspective how how well did you connect with that main character I think at first it was a little bit difficult as the story progressed I feel like it was a little bit easier to connect I think and maybe part of that is just the confusion that that character herself was in. Okay. But as as it progressed, yeah, I feel like her, uh, maybe like her motivations or whatever were a little bit more clear. So it was easier to follow their thoughts as they, you know, be in that other voice in your head or whatever the case may be. I feel like it was a little bit easier as the, as the chapters progressed. Okay. But definitely at first it was, not even at first, first chapter was okay. It was maybe like that, second chapter or something like that towards the end of the first where it was uh, kind of jarring. Okay. And Danny? I think this, I felt the same way as you did where I liked the beginning. I was like, oh, okay, she has a best friend. I mean, I grew up, I had a best friend too, you know, that kind of thing. And then as soon as she got taken to the dragon's tower, I was really confused. But then again, so was she. So maybe I related a little more than I thought to her. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, towards, I mean, all throughout, I feel like I, I related a lot to her because I just kind of, you know, do what I want. I feel like I kind of understood how she could feel that way. I like to put myself in other people's shoes anyways of, okay. So she starts off feeling really, like, confused about being in the Dragon's Tower, and then she is slowly gaining more and more confidence and starts to make her own decisions instead of kind of just going with the flow. And I've been in those situations where at first I feel really awkward. And then as you kind of get more um, aware of your own abilities, then you get more confident. And so that kind of made sense to me. Uh, I think she started off a little meeker than I am. So there were a couple of chapters where I couldn't quite relate because kind of how like Chris how you were saying if it if you're saying it's I am doing this as the first person then I have to feel like I could be that person right and in some situations I was like "Mm." yeah there was there's quite a bit in the beginning where 
I felt a little disconnected from the main character, like really disconnected from the main character. I don't think it ever actually clicked back with me. Mm. And so throughout the whole book, I felt kind of this disconnect between the main character and other people. Uh, Was there a character that you felt that you connected the most with so far in the first half of the book? No. No? Okay. No. I I didn't really connect with any of the characters. Mm. Um, I... And I think that's because of the first person thing where you're supposed to connect with the main character. I mean, she's written in uh, vague, right? Mm So she's given very few physical features or personality traits uh, in the beginning. So that way you can kind of find out who she is as it goes. But by that point in time, I'd kind of already disconnected. And then um, the other people are... Jerks. (laughs) Jerks. <laughs> Jerks <laughs> and side characters. So Yeah, so yeah. It's, it, it, I don't know. Um, I like the way it's written and the prose and everything. Uh, but for this particular character, I just couldn't, I couldn't, it didn't quite land. Mm. I wonder if part of that is because I don't know if either of you have ever been in the kind of situation that she is. I'm talking to Chris and Juan where sometimes guys just do what they want. And a lot of the male characters in this book kind of just go for what they want. And she doesn't have a lot of ownership over the situation. And in some situations, I could definitely see why. There's a person in a position of power in all of these cases that are mm, putting her in her place. Calling the shots. Yeah, and kind of pushing her around and kind of Putting her in positions that I have found myself in. And so I, I, I think that that can be difficult to relate to if that's not part of your reality, maybe. I don't know if you got that too, but. I feel like I definitely related to that situation, but I also think that Juan and Chris probably have been put in that situation before where there are people around them that just like call the shots all the time and they're like well i'm capable too you know i can do things (laughs) yeah it's called corporate america yeah (laughs) so but then again it's it's a 17 year old girl and we're we're a bit beyond maybe (laughs) twice that (laughs) in our ages so believe it or not i am not 17 (laughs) so yeah that that's understandable as long as the the story is consistent as long as whatever the is going on in the story and that world is consistent, it's easy for me to like suspend disbelief. And I'm just like, sure, that's just the way it is in your world. So, and I think like being in her head, I like being put in those positions as you were saying, Kelly, and she's kind of going through these, like her thoughts themselves contradict where she's like, maybe this is something that I could see myself doing, but also no. And I'm like, well, you know, if I was in that time period and I, I mean, she thinks that she's being sent up there as a, like an offer to this guy. They, at this point, she doesn't know what happens to these girls that go in this tower. And now there's like this big, handsome prince that, you know, not only is he in a position of power, he's also very powerful because he, they mentioned that he looks like he's lived in armor most of his life. I, I, I don't know. I could see like how, um, not powerless, but like how easy it would just be to like, well, I guess this, like this is just what's expected. And to relate to that is uh, I used to box and sometimes you'd get in a ring and there was a, and your sparring partners are, you know, sometimes smaller, sometimes bigger. And every once in a while you'd, uh, there was this one guy, Carlos. He's like, Hey, at the time I was a lot smaller than him. He's this big dude. He's like, Hey, I need to work on my speed and reflexes. He's like, would you mind sparring with me? Sure. I didn't think, uh, didn't think anything of it. Well, this guy starts wailing on me. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Every time he hit me, it, feel like, it felt like a log had fallen on me. And I, I mean, honestly, for a second, I was like, luckily, there's people watching. So, you know, you can't <laughs> just run out of the ring. <laughs> but for about three minutes, I felt like there was just trees. I felt like the whomping willows were oh, just <laughs> whomping away. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Three minutes is a long time. Hey, yes, Y'all it see is. this? Y'all see this? <laughs> is no one going to ring the bell? Yeah. yeah. I've been in here for 45 minutes. You look at the clock, you're like, how is there, how is there still a, a minute and a half left? I survived. I did survive the round. 
And then I got the hell out of there. <laughs> and our coach would, uh, he would yell at people. If you, if you were in there ooing and aahing and laughing, he would yell at you. Unless it was him laughing. Oh, of course. Yeah. He'd sit there and start laughing <laughs> because he could. It, it'll make you stronger. Yeah. Speaking of something that you brought up, which is how does, like, so she's basically just expected to go to his house and uh, our main character is supposed to just go to the dragon's house and do what he wants. She got there because of this tradition that their little town has. Their town is specifically like the dragon town or whatever. Um, and the dragon is just this wizard who I guess owns the land. Or... He's like assigned the land. Uh, okay. He's like assigned protectorate of the land. But he doesn't make himself very publicly available. Like he's not having a beer with the homies or anything like that. He's just like stays in his little tower unless somebody needs him. Then he disgruntledly comes down takes care of the problem and huffs off. Um, but what's unique about this character is that he, every 10 years, will come into town and grab a girl and bring her back to the tower, and nobody sees this girl for 10 years. And then they come back, and he takes another one. And, and everyone is apparently... Like, they have a whole ceremony for this. They line up all the girls who are born... So every 10 years, he takes a 17-year-old. So they line up all the 17-year-olds. Starting October to the next October. Yeah, so it's like yeah, a one-year so time frame. a one-year mm-hmm. time frame. And then they have a feast all set up, and they have offerings set up. and They he, call them dragonborn. Yeah, the dragonborn are the girls that are born in the year that they might get chosen. Uh, which is kind of a sick name, but not a great situation, I don't think. But it's, So it's so built into this society that they have a name for this generation of kids. They line them up in their finest attire and they train them for however many years, 17 years, I guess, to be the perfect specimen for this guy who's just, it's just some guy. And they just let them take the daughter to the house. And that's the tradition of the town. And the training that they give them is specifically to be like servants or like to, I would imagine like at the time to like serve this man that they assume they're going to go up to be like, taking care of them and like it's like cooking for nobles 101 right yeah and uh-huh. you have to get to the 400 level class before yeah. the dragon's going to be willing to take you <laughs> and maybe sing him a song after dinner so you know yeah. just just generally be there to take care of him now i will say this about that tradition though they did specify in the beginning of the book that it's not as bad as some of the other nobles because they were talking about some of the other nobles in the land where they're like yeah all men are conscripted and have to go to war for six years and then they come back or however many years it was. It's like, yeah, it could be worse. Like we just have to give up one of our daughters every 10 years in this barony or whatever it is. And they all assume the worst also. They're oh, yeah. like, oh, I'm sure he's doing the nasty with them <laughs> the entire 10 years. And in reality, that's not the, the case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he wears them just out non-stop. and then he's a new one. <laughs> He sends them packing with a bag of silver. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for your services. You're too old now. So there's, I'm going to like jump ahead real quick. Yeah. If that's okay. He is appalled that he, that the villagers think that of him. And he's like, that's not me. I don't do that. And he's like, you guys (laughs) think that about me? And they're like, what the fuck? What the else, fuck? Else yeah. do we think you like, do? Of with course, them. we think that yeah, all you they do, do is nothing else. Be a dick to everyone. <laughs> He's like, yeah. I've, and I'm, we have no way of proving otherwise. Right? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, yeah, maybe I should come into town a little more often because. Uh, <laughs> and also, I want to know how long this has been going on because he's like really old, and for this to have been happening every ten years for like let's say a hundred years or something, and he never learned that the villagers thought that about him. It's and very he's like reclusive. Yeah, I mean, for over, like a century or something. Like I don't know. I just I also just, I don't I don't think anyone's gonna bring it up to him. Yeah, I like, wouldn't say it. Yeah, he's a most yeah. powerful dark sorcerer. I know around. Like, and, I'm not going to tell him back he's, the, he's holding back the darkness of the wood. Yeah, but this is just like single handedly. You cannot yeah. judge a book by its cover. <laughs> I mean, you can. He's a real dick. <laughs> when I picture this guy in my mind, he looks just like the guy in Arcane. The oh, the, the one who adopts guy? Jinx. Yeah, the, the, the evil one, the Kanaiver. Yeah, mm-hmm. 
I think he, uh, yeah, I, I kind of picture him that way too. Like evil and with the, the squinty face and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, I was, I was lis- like reading through it and I first was like, damn, this guy is mean. But then I'm like, but your foes would be meaner to you. Like, so it's like mm-hmm. uh, maybe the, like drill sergeants yelling at you or like a boxing coach yelling at you when you're uh, doing push ups and he says, hey, I'm 68 years old. And if I can do 100 push ups in a row, you can do 100 push ups in a row. I mean, that would be one thing if Except she was going to you. training once a week or twice a week or whatever, but this is all day, every day. If she walks in the room, he calls her an idiot and useless and not worth any of his time. Every time she does anything, he's like, oh, you don't know how to do this in like a really condescending, rude way. Like, how would she possibly know how to do that? She's lived on a farm her whole life. How would she know how to cook? Or Um, cast spells. Or cast spells. She... She is super bored because there's nothing to do in this castle, so she grabs a book off the shelf. And what does he do? He comes flying in in an absolute rage, grabs her by her neck, and throws her on the bed and screams right in her face. Are you serious? That's abuse. And that happens all the time. Yeah, so (laughs) I would say that this is a great time to transition into Stockholm Syndrome. I think that she demonstrates a lot of characteristics of somebody who is affected by Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is when captives form an emotional, positive bond with their captor. But in this situation, she just got kidnapped or taken, but essentially kidnapped. Um, And she only, like, saw this guy in passing every now and then. uh Uh-huh. And so fear is a big part of it, too. Fear makes you compliant, and fear can often turn into another passionate emotion, like love or empathy, um, attachment. Mm. which is a defense mechanism in a way, but also because if you are acting more loving towards your captor, they are more likely to keep you alive because that is a positive um, reflection. Relationship kind of grows in that kind of way. And she just, every checkbox that I have seen on Stockholm Syndrome is what she's displaying in her everyday life. And so... If the captive sees the captor as having some degree of kindness, which could be an absence of abuse, which in her case, I think, was taking the time to train her, even though he didn't really have to. Or not yell at her every now and then. Every once in a while, he doesn't yell at her. (laughs) While she's out um, gallivanting, because at one point she kind of leaves the castle. He leaves the castle, so she also leaves the castle, but she goes back. She's She's not trying to escape. She's just trying to help someone out. Um, while she's out, she has this thought of, oh, um, she, she has to kind of like transform herself in order to gain respect by like making herself look really elegant and beautiful. And as she's doing that, she's like, the dragon would be so proud of me right now. And so she's still just like cloying for his approval, even though he's just this monster. I don't know. I, I just really thought that a lot of what I saw happen was reflective of Stockholm Syndrome. Here's what I got on the opposite side of that coin. To me, it almost seemed like, I hate the term grooming. It's a tradition for them to offer somebody up. You know, like they're training Kasha all her life. And Kasha's like, well, of course, this is what I'm going to do. And it reminds me of like the, like the Aztecs or the uh, tribes in that area that would have these massive sacrifices and people, or at least as the way they tell the story were elated to be chosen as the person that's going to be sacrificed. And there was like, they would build temples and then the big like break in the champagne was actually just like a bunch of beheadings. And people were like, Time like to go meet your they, God. Were, they were proud that it was like, Oh, that was one of my family members that like mm. fed the sun God or something. So, I'm wondering if there is a bit of that in play there where she's like, oh, well, this is expected of me. So I, I need to like live up to that, um, uh, that expectation, I guess. Um, he does take it a bit far with the, uh, with the most whack ass insults. <laughs> I, I love how he's repeatedly calling people lunatics. And like, <laughs> <laughs> what is wrong with you? That is the one thing actually that like, about his behavior that really bothered me. The rest of the stuff, I'm like, okay, well, if that's 
like her saying, okay, well, if I'm the chosen one, then I need to make sure that I like learn what he's teaching me. Mm -hmm. But it's the like the it's the name calling, I think. That's like I can see if he's stern and he's like, but it's for a reason. Yeah. Because one day you're going to have to use this. And I think she says something about like when she's not taking it seriously, like learning the magic. And she's just like, well, that's good enough. What do you expect from me? And then he leaves. And she's like, oh, that's because it's not just for me. If he's gone, I may have to use the magic to defend my village or something. Yeah, I think that's what frustrated me about the magic um, aspect of her learning in the tower Mm. was she was shown, hey, you have the ability to do magic. I don't know, like, (laughs) that's cool. I would be all about that. Mm -hmm. And she's just like, eh, I can do it manually. That's fine. I I don't need to learn this. I can just scrub the pots on my own. I'm like... Why would you want to do that? Magic is cool, but I'm not I I'm not that person, so. So we find out that when Enyashka does some magics with the dragon and they start to form this like bond thing and it goes a little bit romantic in that little mm-hmm. like way, but actually we learn later that it's power hunger. It's it's, it's like a, an addiction to the power, to, to magic and, and tapping into somebody else's power because that happens at the very end of the last half of the book because where the Falcon and, and Yashka do magic together towards the end, then he tries to keep holding her, like keep holding her wrist. He like keeps trying to stay intact with her uh, magic. And so I feel like it's not quite the Stockholm Syndrome in that case where she has this um, attraction to the dragon but I think because she's starting to work together with him and draws upon his magic and she has an addiction to tapping into his magic and it's not really a romantic bond right away because she's like, oh, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I thought it was a metaphor for tearing up a dance floor on a hot summer night with somebody. <laughs> I really like that the magic is helpful. It's not just like war magic or healing magic. It's also, I don't like my clothes today. Boop. Now I, I look wish. pretty. I Wouldn't wish, that be nice? Dude, I wish. <laughs> if I could just do this in the morning and just like tap with my magic wand or whatever. They don't have wands, but in this book at least. But if I could just say, I'd like to be dressed and be <laughs> dressed, that would be great. Also, if you need a particular look for a particular occasion, I think you kind of touched up on it earlier where she's like going somewhere and she's like, oh, no one's going to take me seriously. If I'm like in a nightgown or whatever it was she was in and she's like, now I'm royalty. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. So when she gets to the first town, when she's trying to like hop over and save everybody and replace the dragon because he's gone gallivanting, fighting a chimera, which was a trap. Anyway, so she goes down. It was and she's a distraction. Like, it was a distraction. And so she goes and she's like, whoop. And she gets, you know, made up in her like little dress and stuff. And people are like, oh shit, you can do magic? <laughs> what? That's crazy. And she's like, <laughs> if only they knew it was only a cantrip. And I was wondering, Chris, if you could tell us, because we're not as experienced in the magical realms as you are, what a cantrip is and why she is embarrassed that she only knows cantrips. Like, I mean, if I knew anything, I'd be like, yeah, I'm powerful wizard, y'all. <laughs> uh, cantrip is just a very, very simple spell. It's uh, something that you should be able to pull basically out your ass without any hesitation. So it would be like, uh, pick a card, any card, but just magic. And so simple fireballs, simple um, things like she's doing, like changing her clothes. Those should be really, really easy. It should be something that someone can pick up really quickly. Um, there's a really good reason why I think that she doesn't pick up on it. And it actually is a and d reason. So um, I, I'm going to relate it back to D&D. She's a sorcerer in a wizard's tower. She is trying to learn how to do magic in a wizard way, but she has no um, affinity for it. Her magic is sorcery. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. It, that, that's what it looks like to me. Yeah. Like she has the intuitive magic sense. The, I can just pick up and, okay, it, it's it's about like this. And it's something in this neighborhood. And as long like as a like, jazz musician almost. Yeah, like yeah. A, a jazz musician Improvise, versus yeah. improv. Well, it would be like a jazz musician playing with a um, concert pianist. Yeah. Right? Where they're, they can complement each other if they work together. 
but for the most part, they're going to have different styles. They're going to have different ways of accenting something. Um, when you're doing some kind of improv in the middle of a, um, of a play, right? So say it's like, I need to improv this part of this. A lot of actors do that, right? But you have the classical actors who will just memorize their lines. And so those two don't mesh well together until they do. Right. And so I think that that's a lot of what's happening with her magic style is she doesn't get the cantrips. She, she's not learning them because they're not the way she learns it. But as soon as she picks up that one journal from the other person who learned the same way she did, she instantly grasped, Oh yeah, she gets it. She understands that all you need is really the direction you're going. And then you can just wing this high level magic and she's able to perform stuff that the dragon can't do. Right. It's, it's, it's that like the, that's why they're butting heads. He's not teaching her the right way. That's actually an interesting uh, thing that you pointed out because I, I, w- I did pick up on that where he's like very methodical and he's like, no, you have to tell me exactly what you did. And like, how, how did you whisper that thing? And she's like, I, I don't know. You, she's like, you just kind of feel it out and like go with the flow. And he's like, no, no, no. <laughs> like, you need to tell me exactly like how yeah. long did you hold that note for? How long? And like you, you could tell that they're both like, they're trying to figure out in their own way what the other person is doing or, or whatever the case is. If you're listening right now, I really want to hear what your favorite cantrip is because I don't know very many and whatever you throw out there, I'm just going to throw into my next D and D game. She yes, please too. enlighten us. <laughs> there was something uh, on the topic of magic, Chris, and I wanted to see what you thought of this mm-hmm. was he and one of his outbursts, he mentioned something about uh, you're going to get eaten by whatever is in the wood. You're only going to make it stronger or something Ooh, along yeah. those lines. To me, it just came back. You know, it's like life. We consume the life of something else essentially to for ourselves to grow and sustain our life. Mm-hmm. But is is that common in magic? Can you for and I don't know if consume is the right word, but it sounded like whatever was out there was I don't know if eat or he was going to pull her essence out and only make itself grow stronger or if that is like the um the catalyst for this thing whatever is out there that starts a reaction um it's a uh, there's a common theme in magic especially when it comes to an evil consuming a person is that someone who can do magic they're generally more sought after to consume them like i would make sense i would like to eat the magic candy (laughs) not just the regular candy yeah um and especially when it comes to like people's quote-unquote souls and stuff like that like you take warhammer 40k and they have to feed the emperor ten thousand souls a day in order to keep him alive which is pretty messed up. We're back at the Aztecs We're back again. at the Aztecs. I mean, you, you should be happy you're being sacrificed to the emperor. Let the temple flow red. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just one of those um, things where it's like the more powerful the soul, the the, the more tasty it is. That's a, it, that is a common gotcha. theme. Okay. And so if you had a demon who, I mean, who wouldn't want to control a wizard versus a peasant, right? Right. Unless that peasant can throw really good sand in your eyes. I mean. <laughs> pocket sand. Pocket sand. <laughs> Never underestimate Were you the power that? of No, a I, my hands are just really dirty. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like the flower that I insisted everybody have in their pockets when we played Call of Cthulhu. And I was like, yeah, just in case the monster arrives, throw flower at them. I was like, I hope it's not a like a hot summer night when we're playing because you're... <laughs> It's just going to be a mess. So you're going to reach for your car keys. And We're all just be... Pillberry Doughboys. <laughs> By flower, she means actual baking flour. Okay, I have another story. So okay. Juan and I once did the color run. And by run, everyone was walking. Like that was one of the, the most surprising things about doing one of those types of runs is that nobody actually runs this thing. So, uh, and then here, okay, I'm going to like fast walk the entire way. And then you're getting pelted with this like colorful dust. And then when you start sweating... It's not pretty. These colors like just run together. You're just coated in like this chalky dust of like brown colors. It looked Ew. like someone had poured like banana bread dough on us. <laughs> it was just, it, it, it was looked disgusting. really cool at first. And then by the time you're making your way back, I like look down. I'm like, 
<laughs> All right, well, we're done with pictures. <laughs> See, yeah. we, did, we did a bubble run, and that was a little bit better, except for people would stop in the bubbles, and there's no visibility in the bubbles, and so you would just run uh, headlong uh, into somebody. What? Yeah. They would be like, oh, it's bubbles. I'm just going to go really slow right here. Because the bubbles come down and they're all different colors. So it's kind of fun. You're trying to like get your white shirt all covered in the different color bubbles. But some people are short and small. And the bubbles just grow and grow and grow and grow. And so the bubbles were like up to my shoulders. So if there's a child or a dog... They're going down. I'm going down. I'm going to trip right over them. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Super fun though. So it was a common theme that came up during the entire first half of the book is she would assume something and then it would turn out to be something completely different. She would assume the dragon is a, you know, stand up guy. Turns out he's a real dick. It would, she assumed that Prince Merrick was a nice dude, but now he's Prince Rapey pants, right? (laughs) (laughs) Like, Right? So everything she assumes... He's very entitled. You're being a Mr. Rapey Pants right now. (laughs) You need to knock it off. Oh, no. Not in my house, mister. (laughs) To be fair, she brains him with a a serving tray and nearly kills him. I think she should have thrown him out the window and killed him. But, you know, that's uncouth back in the day. Um, But, like, there was a lot of instance I saw of she sees something for what like surface level and underneath it's something completely different. Yeah. And I think we brought up earlier the uh, myth or whatever going around town of like what the dragon was doing to these beautiful young ladies that he was bringing up there. And then he's like, talented ladies. Whoa, 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 whoa. What? (laughs) What's going on down there? You think I am Mr. Rapey pants? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I, I just I just found that like throughout the entire book, like the especially like the the perception of the forest and the perception of the wood, which were two different things that they talked about, right? So the wood looks fine from the outside, maybe a little bit dark, but it's really not. It's really not a great place. Um, but maybe to her it is because she I think has some minor immunities to the wood. So maybe her perception is more on point than everyone else's. I think maybe her magic might have given her a little bit of protection. There was a something in there about her like going off into the forest or whatever and like gathering Getting, gathering blackberries. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I I was a little bit confused. I'm like I thought you were supposed to stay away. <laughs> yeah, I think it was her magic that allowed yeah. her to get get into the edge of the woods and like get out unharmed cuz um she had told the story about talking to the trees too. Agni was walking around and, and she's like, oh, I, my like skirts are torn up or whatever. Like her, she's just making a mess. She's like, and Kasha's like, I was walking with you. I literally saw a tree like reach over and Smack like you. Yeah. Like even the trees are abusive in this place. <laughs> so not a great world to be living in right now. No. The expectations versus reality the perception goes all the way right up until when we like right at the end when they get up to that big tree in it and they walk up to it like, Oh, hardy, har, har. And then all of a sudden everybody starts getting decapitated because there yeah. were bugs on the tree and nobody bothered to look for bugs. <laughs> Cause it's all something different. Than perception. What, it was all something different. <laughs> yeah. Not, not one. Um, but it's all something different than what you, you see. It turns out to be something different. That's I, a constant theme I saw. I want to know why the dragon knew ahead of time he was like yeah this is a bad idea we do not want to go get the queen and everyone's like okay well it would be worth it it would be worth anybody to get the queen back and he's like yeah (laughs) i i on that one i sided with the dragon i think that it was not worth it to go get the queen because after 20 years i can understand exactly yeah the world has moved on without her i think that they don't need her anymore and 20 years has proven that (laughs) and honestly she got possessed. She got possessed by whatever. So they found her inside of a tree after this long, arduous journey into the woods. They brought soldiers. They brought, like, the the prince N- and Noble the dragon Steve's. and the wizards and everybody went into this woods. They find her in a tree, and she's just, like, dead to the world. She feels nothing. She responds to nothing. Like, not a great queen. You can't even... 
recognize walk, your own son. Can't even walk without a leash. Yeah, they true. chain her neck and like chain her to the cart, and she just walks behind the cart. Like what? 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 <laughs> I mean, she's been living in a tree for twenty years. She would not know how to. If if she lost sight of him, she'd be lost. And she'd be in a different tree for 20 years. I she'd wonder... probably walk back to the forest. Yeah. 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 I'm going back to my tree. <laughs> Before I that don't... goddamn elbow comes back. They can't. Like... They burn the tree. <laughs> like I, was, I, was, I was happy being a Keebler. Just <laughs> being inside the just tree. Just living in my tree. And there was a no little problem, cookies. Num, num, num. That one owl that kept seeing how many, how many suckers he could eat or whatever. How yeah, many, many dicks does he take? One, two, two three. three. Crunch. <laughs> three. I'm really curious about this possession because it it affects anybody who is touched by the wood. And uh, they go into this this place inside, deep inside their mentality. And it's like they're in a dream, kind of, that they're basically getting beaten by a whomping willow for eternity. But then their bodies are being possessed and, like, killing everyone around them or just being, like, malicious and evil Mm -hmm. and out of their control. But the queen, who's been possessed for like 20 years, like she, if she, I mean, if you haven't committed suicide at that point, I don't know what this girl's doing. Well, she what is couldn't. she doing? Just she like couldn't. wandering around for 20 years in this, like, or just sitting down. But I'm curious, like, what the actual intent of the wood is. What is the wood? I think the wood is like its own living entity of some kind. Is it like Cthulhu that we keep talking about? <laughs> I, I'm, it might I'm be. not. I'm not sure if it's like Cthulhu. I haven't read any Cthulhu stories like this particular one, but it reminds me more of like a poltergeist almost mm. slash um, demonic possession, where uh, the demon itself can't do anything. It's only through a host that it can actually act. Mm. So um, it needs to kick the host out or imprison it, and then I get your body for as long as you stay in prison. And I get to do whatever with it I want. And in the queen's case, it was I'm going to go into the go and be the living soul that is keeping this heart tree alive, right? Um, yeah. So would if it's this, let's just call it like energy for a phantasm sure. that's just like uh, there waiting to take over a host. Um, because at one point there were a bunch of mad cows. They they didn't know about mad cow disease yet, but it's true. So they I, were bit by wolves, <laughs> right? Yeah, and that's that's kind of where I was going. Like the, how they like transfer, and it's interesting to me always. Like if something like sometimes it's like some kind of possession that only affects humans, where you're like, oh, this person has like some demonic possession. But what if that demon is just like, I just need a host. Doesn't matter if it's a cow, a wolf, a cat. There was a really good movie. What was that movie we the watched? Thing? No, I was thinking the movie with because uh, the thing like oh mimics the Pazuzu your body. one yeah the Pazuzu, <laughs> Pazuzu? one Pazuzu <laughs> what yeah what is it with Denzel oh my Washington God. yeah it, where he's been you... Pazuzu'd <laughs> but no it was like Den- Denzel but that was Washington. what it is if you look somebody in the eyes then the demon can jump to the other body because the eyes are the windows to oh, the soul dude body snatchers are like my favorite but they're so crazy so, yeah so the only way to kill this demon is to kill it while there's because then once you kill it it's it's soul is free so you can't repossess somebody or there's some something about it but its soul becomes free floating and if it, if there's nothing to latch on to within a certain um distance it dies there is a an episode in lost girl it's like a canadian magical show and there is a body snatcher and she goes into a morgue and the body snatcher just keeps reanimating all these or jumping into the bodies of all these different Corpse. already cor- yeah or corp corpse eye corpse eye <laughs> corpses <laughs> corpses <laughs> and uh, and they're trying to figure out how to fucking kill this thing because everybody's already dead so oh. it, it, it comes into that part where it's like they literally you know cannot how inconvenient it would be to jump into somebody who's already dead rigor mortis is a bitch. Uh. <laughs> Oh That's my true. god, it's doing the robot. No, I just can't no. move. <laughs> See, I had a theory about uh the zombie apocalypse, and my theory was that um the zombie apocalypse, the the zombies, the shufflers that you see, they're the easy mode zombies, and those are between like 
two hours and 72 hours dead because that's rigor mortis. And then after that, things get a little bit more limber and they become the running zombies. So the uh, goal would yeah. be they to kill up. them within 72 hours after death. So that's what I think a good zombie movie would be is to hunt down zombies before they can become runners. Oh. Anyway. Well, so I really liked the way that the possession worked in this story because they kind of do become zombie-like. And like... So there are two different people that become actively possessed. Um, one is a farmer guy and one is Kasha. And both of them kind of, I, f- I felt like I read them as they had very different um, manifestations of their possession. Kasha's, I think, was scarier. The farmer was... Jersey. Jersey. The guy Jersey. They, they turned his ass into a doorstop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's out in the barn. He got too wild and they turned him to stone and put him in the backyard. <laughs> Dude, she, she literally turned him to stone and she's like, I don't know how to fix this right now, but one she she went the route of Walt Disney where he's like, hey, just freeze me. Maybe one day you can bring me back. <laughs> they just turned him to stone and used him as a doorstop in the barn. She, and like, she just hit pause. Like, we'll get back to that. I just <laughs> imagine. <laughs> one day your dad will be. I just imagine them going out to the barn and instead of it being like the guy chained up, he's got like a little bird nest on his head yeah. and like little squirrels are started nesting around him. And then you like go to unfreeze him and they're like, hey man, hell, that was my statue. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Agni comes out and like goes and sees him and because he's been attacked by his mad cows and he is all zombie like his skin and his nails are melting off and he's all horrible looking he's trying to bite everybody like a freaking zombie he's like actually though like reaching out and taunting everybody in that really mean like laughing while he says it kind of way like reagan from the exorcist he's like oh hello witch girl you came to see me and just like starts laughing like a crazy thing and that's when she's like nope turns him to stone and <laughs> leaves <laughs> and he does it again when when uh they unturn him unturn him they they turn him back to fleshiness mm-hmm. um then he he starts taunting the prince and is like using his mom's voice yeah which i thought was brilliant because that does show it's like a possession of whatever's inside is c- permanent permanently captured wood that's yeah. what always is so scary to me when they use different voices like that was not even a male voice that this guy was using. It was literally an old woman. That freaks me out. Even, I think, uh, during Kasha's possession, where she's like, oh, it's it's like actually her. And then they make mention that uh, once it's revealed that, oh, there is something else going on, it's like, oh, it, it's not even like, it's not even bothering to keep up the charade anymore. Yeah, no, it's pretending to be Kasha, and it's telling her like, oh, you you should... I don't remember how exactly she said it, but she was basically saying, you need to hurt the dragon. The dragon's not a good guy. You really need to just fuck him up. and Like forever. Like yeah. he needs to die. Yeah. And she's being her own regular sweet self because she's like the little angel of the community. Um, but she's saying some things that kind of make Agni's mind go like, wait a minute, something's not right. And as she starts to question, like, I don't think, are you really you? Are you really Kasha? And then it's just like a light switch. And Kasha's like, Nip. nope. And goes blank and no longer has her Kasha personality. Now she's just the wood. And you can see the hatred of the wood in her eyes. It's just so scary. That's what I think is worse because she she was acting like a friend. Yeah. And if it, was, if it wasn't for that one freak realization, like really bad stuff could have happened and the demon would have been in control. Oh, for sure. I can't remember what story it was, or I used to watch a lot of horror movies, and some of them were better than others, and some of them were uh, like old '80s, just like you know, everything else sucked, but maybe like just one aspect of it was really cool. But it was that like, it's not quite Uncanny Valley, but there is like, oh, I think this is the right person, but there's just something about their eyes that's not the same. Or, like, there's just some little gesture, something very, like, they got most of it, but it's just that one thing where you're like, that's really weird, because you never used to do that, or whatever the case may be. I think that's what kind of freaks me out. Yeah. The comparison that I made here was that she reminded me of the other mother in Coraline, 
where she was mm. exactly like you were saying, something's not quite right. In that yeah. case, it's button eyes. Yeah. This one was wood eyes. There is a Spanish horror movie, and I can't remember what the name of it is, but there is a, a woman has a, some kind of surgery on her face where her whole face is bandaged up, and it's these two little kids, and they go uh, with the mom to like this really beautiful house out in the woods because she used to recover from her surgery, and they slowly start to realize, and her whole face is bandaged, but they slowly start to realize that that's not their mom. Mm. And horror ensues dun, dun, dun. So what was that show we were watching I'm not where it was in the <laughs> <laughs> it was in the ice oh um uh it was about the the volcano that exploded what was Kat- it called katla 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 yeah k-t-l-a it's about a icelandic volcano that erupts mm. and um out come the body snatchers kind of or the changelings. Changelings is what they're called. Mm. And they have a purpose. Yeah, that That's was a, really cool. Yeah. They like took over bodies of people who had disappeared. And then they came back. And everyone was like all excited that these people that they thought were missing had come back, but they weren't quite right. Yeah. Like, uh, for instance, one of the people that came back was a kid who had died like five years ago. Oh, damn. The, the parents watching the kid die. And holding him in their arms when he dies, and now he's back. That's a good one. Yeah, it was. It's a very creepy show. The mom's like, "I gotta drown you again." <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! No, I think it was the dad who said something like that. So, would you rather feel corrupted, like in pain, or feel nothing? Actually, now that we raise the question here, it is it's like difficult to even contemplate. Like, what is that feeling of corruption? You know, are we Dark talking about thoughts? I think right. uh, like if you've ever been uh, somewhat depressed or anything like that, that like creeping, nagging feeling in the back of your mind that, you know, you could just do it. But like more evil. When I thought about like, what would that corruption be where it's just like you, all your anxieties, and everything starts to boil up, but you're only like the only possible way for you to react is just rage and not, not, not even like murderous rage, but you want to tear apart the fabric of reality. You, I don't know what else. That, to me, is basically what I would, like, what would that? <laughs> I don't know. No, they, ha- they have magic. They can, uh, yeah, yeah, they they can blow you to smithereens with their fingertips. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think corruption might feel um, a little bit like giving in to the urges of oh, the little devil on your yeah shoulder. the one the, the little tiny devil that's like yeah let's just go kick that lady in the face because they're ugly right that that little demon that almost never talks to you or you know when you're going when you you see like uh, some kids playing you just want to boot one in the face right that's the kind of things where you're not going to do that but if you started thinking more corrupt it goes beyond that it's more like you know what if we skinned him alive? Oh, shit. And also, right? what if it's that, like, the ability to realize the worst for anyone or anything, whatever that thing may be? So I think that feeling numb is a lot better than the feeling of corrupted because the corrupted can easily, like, take over your thoughts and lead you down dark places. And uh, feeling numb, like if you're if you're feeling numb, then you have a way out because you're still feeling you. You you may not be feeling anything right now, but you can get back to not feeling numb. When once your brain starts rationalizing the corruption, that's when I don't think there's a way back from yeah, it. Yeah, there's you are not you anymore. Right, that's there's no point. way back. Right, it, it it like that's what I feel corruption being. I think I'm gonna go with corruption. I think I would. <laughs> As long as there is a way to redemption, I feel like that would be worth experiencing. That's if some <laughs> huge character development. He's like, there. that sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> I want let's the challenge. Let's indulge those dark yeah. thoughts. Hell yeah. Let's let's go full dark side like uh, Luke Skywalker. Go yeah. go dark side, come back from dark side. Go dark side, come back from yeah, he, he was like come back. He was like doing a diving pool of dark side. <laughs> Yeah. Great. Well, like a dolphin just jumping out. Luke Skywalker <laughs> is the dolphin of the dark side. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, so what do you guys think? Corruption or nothing? And also, do you think that Luke Skywalker is the dolphin of the dark side or not? If not, what is he? Yeah, maybe he's a platypus of the dark side. I don't know. Now, on that note of like, what do you audience think? We've been uh, trying to read more critically about the books that we've uh, been reading. And we've been digging into some of the bigger concepts here. What do you audience think about this particular book, this section of the book? Did you pull any other big themes out? And also, how do you critically read books? Because this is kind of new ground for all of us. Uh, I had a little bit of experience when it came to one of my classes in school, but nothing, nothing too deep here. Um, so I'm, I'd really be interested in uh, the audience's opinions. on. Tell me how you pick apart stuff. And uh, I have no idea how to get a hold of us. So you can get a hold of us through Instagram probably. <laughs> yes. I recommend Instagram. That's where we're most active. But you can also send us an email. Go to our Facebook. All of these are just dog eared Discourse. Uh, the email is contact us at dog eared Discourse. Yeah, so all that is how you contact us. But I would love to know how you critically think about books or if you even do. Maybe you just are a page turner. Do you guys have any predictions? My prediction is she's going to get her wizarding name maybe first, maybe not. They're going to put her on trial. Um, She's going to not like court very much because they're going to be mean to her like everyone else in her life. Then she is going to get word that the woods attacked and that um, something bad has happened. She's going to have to skedaddle back to her hometown, and which point she encounters the the dragon is in distress of some kind, and she's going to be the one to rescue him, and then hopefully he dies, because <laughs> I really don't like him, but I have a feeling that's not going to happen. I have a feeling they're going to get married and live unhappily ever after in this tower of misery and abduction. Kelly, what That's do you very think? very uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> mm, I think that they're all going to court because the prince is mad that the dragon doesn't want to do anything about his mom, the queen. And so they're going all to court to get that all rectified so that, like, basically put everybody who is involved on trial for being corrupted. And I think that Kasha is going to go to jail and... Our main character is going to try to get her out. And while that's happening, the wood is going to have its revenge on their hometown. And the dragon is going to not succeed in pushing it back. And they're going to have to clean that up somehow. Ooh, I like the idea of um, maybe the queen being possessed still. like, oh. and then And then killing the king. I'll be really interested in that because yeah. they did say that they looked for corruption and they didn't find any in her. Okay. So maybe it's like hidden. Maybe she's just an open channel. Yeah. Oh, she's a portal. Maybe she is a heart tree that's about to plant itself in the center she of the kingdom. She is the, port- the heart tree. <laughs> a walking heart tree. Yeah. Maybe that's why she's a b- maybe. up inside. Yeah. Wait, that's wait, up port- inside. But I do agree. <laughs> I think I think that they're going to get married and... I'm pissed about it, but what can you do? I'm How not- can you be mad about him finding love? <laughs> I mean, it only took him, what, 10 or 12 Did tries? you miss the 45 yeah. minutes of us talking about Stockholm Syndrome? <laughs> That's how. I think that she is going to become Yennefer and rise up with all of her grand power and, and really become her own witch, sorcerer, as you put it. And her and the dragon are going to have to unify though and use their magic together with their little bond that they have to defeat the wood and they're going to burn it to the ground and i think kasha is going to be chilling like her best friend but she's made out of wood now she's like kind of a tree person and they're going to just kind of be magic people in the same cruel world that they live in but together Put together without the wood. So I don't really know what they would do because literally the dragon's whole job is to save the towns from the wood encroaching. So maybe they just like spend their days learning more magics together. I don't know. I don't know. Spend their day making magic. (laughs) Making magic babies. Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> Pop I them out like a Pez dispenser. I don't really think they'd get married or have kids, but I do think they're together in some way because they're very strong characters. I think they all need their own space and their own, like, you know, their things that they do. Um, but I do think that they get together. Well, I don't know that my prediction went that far. I, I, I thought that they would also, because we saw them kind of work together and they're like trying to make this or she's trying to copy the rose that like he had created or something like that. And then there was just this explosion of different plants that surrounded everything. Um, so when we got to the, them trying to like defeat the wood or figure out a way, I was like, huh, I wonder if that's telling us something that they're going to have to basically like push this thing out and recreate this forest. But I also don't think that, I don't think they'll get to the point where they can sleep easy. It's one of those like, well, it's gone for now, but will it return? We might figure out, I I think we'll figure out where it came from and that they will always just have to be on high alert. That's fair. Cool. We will see how everybody did next time. We're going to fold the page corner here, dog ear that corner. And please, um, I'm going to ask this on this area too because I think we need some double date ideas. I would appreciate you telling me on Instagram what your double date ideas are, please. Like, we want to go out on double dates now that the world is opening back up, and that'll be great uh, until World War Three breaks out, and then it'll be a double date of Doom. destruction. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to pick any options randomly. And if we pick yours, we will credit you when we go on your date. And we're going to go on a date a month. So next time we'll finish up Uprooted and talk about what's next on our bookshelf. Please buddy read with us on Goodreads and Instagram at Dog Ear Discourse. Or view our reading schedule of the year on our website at dogeardiscourse.com. And thanks for joining us today. Cheers. 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 Yeah, boy. <laughs>